my son, I was talking to him the other day and he was talking about how he doesn't want his piggy bank to be stolen by the inflation monster. And so he's storing his money in gold and Bitcoin. And like he told me, dad, people must know. They must know about Bitcoin. But it's amazing. Like I have a conversation with him and then I have a conversation with like my uncle or, you know, grandpa, people who just their minds have been solidified, like ossified, right? It, it, it's so much harder for them to catch up. They have to unlearn so much. And it really is like, if you want to change the world, you start with the kids. The difference with us is like, we're not, we're not hiding anything in the show. What's in the show is on the package, right? And that's kind of the difference between some of the other stuff, the other kids shows is they'll, they'll kind of hide it from parents and sneak it in. And we're like, you get what you get. <laughs> if you love it, like show this to your kids. If not, don't worry about it. Greetings and salutations, my fellow plebs. My name is Walker, and this is the Bitcoin Podcast. The Bitcoin time chain is 865667, and the value of one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. Today's episode is Bitcoin Talk, where I talk with my guest about Bitcoin and whatever else comes up. Today, my guest is Johnny Vance, the writer and co-creator of of the Tuttle Twins TV show. If you are not familiar with the Tuttle Twins, it is an educational children's show that teaches kids principles of freedom, Austrian economics, Bitcoin, and a whole lot more, all while being incredibly hilarious. I highly recommend you check it out for yourself and show it to your kids. And if you don't have kids, I still highly recommend you check it out because it is excellent and it is a TV show that people of all ages can learn from. Before we dive in, do me a favor and subscribe to The Bitcoin Podcast wherever you're watching or listening. Give this show a boost on Fountain if you find it valuable. And if you're not using Fountain.fm already for podcasts, what the heck are you doing? Go check it out. You should also check out BitcoinPodcast.net for episodes and additional resources. And head to the show notes to grab discount links for my sponsor, Bitbox, and other partners. Finally, if you have feedback or if you're interested in sponsoring The Bitcoin Podcast send an email to hello at bitcoinpodcast.net. Without further ado, let's get into this Bitcoin talk with Johnny Vance of the Tuttle Twins. Johnny, man, thanks for hop hopping on here. Uh, great to see you again, not in the flesh like in Nashville, but this will have to do for now. Yeah, pleasure, man. How you been? Been been living uh my voice is uh my voice is a little rough because i i just got back from a wedding this weekend so i do apologize for that in advance uh many good times were had probably too good of times hence the bad voice uh but but yeah it, it was it, a it was a bitcoin wedding too right it, it was it indeed it was indeed a bitcoin wedding um so. and like honestly it's just like it it's awesome to get together with bitcoiners and not have a conference i gotta say i was like this is this is kind of great. Um, like I'm really, really here for this. Uh, but, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it was a treat. Um, and I'm just, I'm also like, I'm a sucker for a celebration of love, you know? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's good. And especially it's like, I love that Bitcoiners seem to be like having babies, getting married, being super hopeful and, I, it it can't be a coincidence. I mean, I have a lot of other friends too who are not like hardcore Bitcoiners. They are also getting. I went to some you know fiat uh, fiat weddings this summer. A uh, bunch of my friends are having kids too. But it seems like the like the concentration is higher within the Bitcoiner space. I don't know if you see that as well. Maybe that's just you know anecdotally true. But yeah, it's uh, it seems like Bitcoiners are, are are doing a lot of marrying and baby making these days. Yeah. I'd love to see it. I mean, not the, you know, you know what I meant. Yeah. But yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I, I would love to see a chart, though. I would love to see it charted out and just see yeah, how many babies, how many weddings versus, you know, where you are on the fiat Bitcoin spectrum and, <laughs> and see the correlation. <laughs> so, somebody, somebody's got to do that analysis. Um, but yeah, well, well, I appreciate you jumping on here and and reaching out about this because I was uh, I was very stoked because obviously I'm a huge fan of Tuttle Twins and what you guys are doing, 
And I, I feel like I haven't seen uh, haven't seen a ton of podcast appearances out of your crew. And so I was like, well, this is awesome. Like people really love what you guys are doing. And I think it's great to kind of get a little bit of the behind the scenes like, OK, this is, you know, this is how the uh, the educational sausage is made, so to speak. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, I think we just forget to do press because we're so busy creating in a closet. We just are in our own little, you know, literally a small closet office kind of place. And yeah, so my apologies and thank you for graciously accepting and and, uh, and talking about it. Uh, we're so excited to um, kind of have another Bitcoin episode to launch. The Bitcoin community has been so awesome and they just have kind of embraced us uh total twins is not for those of you who don't know it's not like a bitcoin centric show it's a freedom centric show you could say like the magic school bus of economics and freedom for kids um and so uh it's just been so gratifying though to see the bitcoin community just like love our stuff and and, and support us well and i mean you definitely uh i think topics of freedom generally like even if something's not explicitly about Bitcoin, it's like that all weaves in, right? Like if right. Like, like these are things that Bitcoiners care about and even Bitcoiners don't want to only hear about just Bitcoin constantly. And uh, right. so I, I think you, you guys, you guys do a really nice job of that. But, you know, I want to, I've got, I've got a, a, actually a bunch of questions for you just because I'm, I'm a curious person, uh, but maybe just kind of like a, a good place to start is just who are you? How did you get here today to be making this, freedom focused educational children's show like how how does one get into that line of work what what was your journey here yes uh walker i ask myself this every day like <laughs> how did i get here <laughs> because yeah making a a children's cartoon about freedom wasn't on my my bucket list for my life um but i'm just i i love it it's a, it's the best um so yeah i i started like uh, let's see, going back to school, I majored in genetics and biotech. So just really, really helped prepare me for what I'm doing today. <laughs> but not like right what, out of not school. Not what I would have guessed. <laughs> no, no, very much a pre-med kind of person. Um, and then, uh, I, I, I took a sketch writing class and it was the funnest thing I'd ever taken. And I spent like 10 times the time writing these sketches just for this class than I did on any of my pre-med stuff. I ended up like getting one of my sketches bought. Um, it was like a homework assignment and it was aired on this like sketch comedy show called Studio C. And then like I got a job as a writer on the show and that transitioned into like a great marketing job. Um, we basically made sketches that sold stuff. So if you've ever seen like the Squatty Potty commercial or like the Purple Mattress or Lumi deodorant commercials, we kind I mean, of helped launch I, I, all those brands and just make ridiculous, hilarious ads online. I have a squatty potty, so like it must have worked. Uh, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and we brought what we developed this weird skill set of, for instance, with squatty potty, we had to teach people about the puberectalis muscle and how it kinks when you're sitting wrong on the toilet when you're squatting wrong. You know, so we made this like weird skill set of entertaining while educating and then we thought well we'd love to do original content what can we do and my co-founder and i daniel we uh thought of this book series we had a good friend connor boyack who'd been writing these these freedom books called tuttle twins and we thought well what if we made this into a kid show what if we made this into something that our kids that we'd want to show our kids and um and yeah, we crowdfunded it, just threw it out there. Parents loved it. We ended up breaking the record for most crowdfunded kid show in the world. We beat a Netflix show, like randomly. And uh, and then we've just been trying to kind of grow it since then. And it's been, you know, it's been a grind, but it's been very gratifying uh, over these past, I guess, three seasons of Tuttle Twins. So. When, when were you guys initially... Uh, initially crowdfunding was this was this pre-covid that you guys were oh gosh were doing it was it, like, like beginning of covid it was like 2020 um like october 2020 so yeah it'd been it'd been going on for six weeks <laughs> uh, okay you know 
to stop the spread. Yeah, a long, a long six weeks by that time. But yeah, uh, God, I mean, it's it's wild because I mean, first of all, it's it's I uh, was not expecting the your background to be as such. Uh, but you know, that's that's the interesting thing I think about uh, a lot of people, maybe a lot of Bitcoiners too, uh, find themselves in this new world where they did not anticipate to be doing what they're doing right now at any point. This wasn't like part of anyone's, you know, like five year or 10 year plan or anything, but then you just kind of find this, this calling, if you will, yeah, and something that you really enjoy, but also something, and you know, hopefully something that makes money as well, but then it's something that is bringing a lot of good to the world. Like it's, it's a, it's, it's a mission that you're on that is beyond just like, I mean, I'm sure the, the ad business was fairly interesting and fairly fun. Clearly you guys did well with it, but I'm guessing you get a lot more fulfillment out of what you do now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's wild. I mean, the type of conversations we're having behind the scenes with guest stars, the type of comments we're hearing from moms, from dads, from kids, it's, it's literally like world changing to us. Cause we're, we, yeah, we, I mean, I guess, yeah, Squatty Potty can help people poop better. But um, like uh, Tuttle Twins can change children's futures. It can change, you know, families. It can change how you save. It, you know, it can. We literally had uh, kids asking their parents to be paid in Bitcoin for their allowance, right after that episode. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's super humbling just to see like we could change uh, the course of somebody's life. And I mean, our goal is to reach a hundred million kids. Uh, I don't know how far we are with that goal, but every year it's getting more and more and it's super exciting. Yeah. It, it's awesome. And I mean, I think like, first of all, what you guys do, I mean, maybe, maybe before I get into kind of some specific questions, I should let you explain a little bit for somebody who maybe has been living under a rock, has not heard of Tuttle Twins yet. Can you talk about just kind of the the premise of the show? You know, okay, they hear kids show. Uh, that could mean a lot of things these days. Yeah. Yeah. What, what what is the Tuttle Twins? Uh, what's the you know what's that what's that fifty thousand foot view of it? How do you guys approach it? What's what's the story you're telling? Yeah, so um, Tuttle Twins is a show about a grandma with a time traveling wheelchair who takes her grandkids on crazy adventures to learn about freedom and economics. And uh, you can think of it like a mix between like Magic School Bus with Phineas and Ferb and probably The Simpsons because <laughs> every other joke is for the parents. Like we made it for ourselves and for our kids. And so we kind of shoot for that sweet spot of like you can watch it as a family and there's not going to be anything that's getting, you're going to have to fumble for the remote. But there's going to be jokes that go over kids' heads, and there's going to be moments that kids die and parents kind of roll their eyes, but hopefully don't turn off the TV. So it's kind of that sweet spot that we shoot for. Um, and yeah, we, we, we focus on kind of uh, each episode is based on a historical figure or some sort of principle that we want to teach. We have an episode called The Inflation Monster that's based off of the creature from Jekyll Island. And so we break it down in a way that kids understand. And the ironic part is that kind of caught us off guard is that when we do it in that way, adults actually understand it too. And, and way more than, you know, sometimes they even learned in school or in economics classes and stuff. And so I think there's just something about cartoons that people just put their guard down and they just, you know, will actually listen and learn. And it's, it's super cool uh, that it's kind of found that place of a family viewing experience. No, I, I love it. I mean, it's a very difficult thing to do to make complex topics, uh, to explain them in a short form way or shorter form way, like distilling down the, for instance, the wisdom of Mises or Hayek into a, a short episode, but furthermore, to do that in a way that it appeals to kids, because I mean, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of crap out there for that is I guess, targeted towards kids these days as a, and as a new dad myself, I'm like starting to kind of look at some of this stuff. He's not really of an age where he's, you know, watching TV or anything yet. And when he eventually is, I want, we want to be extremely cautious about the kind of stuff we're going to expose him to, but it's a very difficult thing. And I know this because this is what Carl and I would do to a much less creative extent than you guys, but with our short form videos, it's like, it's really difficult 
to condense something down into layman's terms and to do it in a small little block of time amidst an environment where everybody is so distracted. And Good. it's this very, you know, it's this, this TikTok kind of uh, world that we're living in now where you've got a few seconds to hook somebody. And if you don't, you, you've lost them. They're on to the next. Yeah. And if you do manage to get them there, okay, how do you make sure that you actually get the message across that you're trying to in a way that's approachable for them? And I think you guys take that to another level, which is how do we do that for kids in a way that's also yeah. like appropriate, but stimulating, but not like two strobe light stimulating, you know, yes. like you know, <laughs> setting off all their, their, their dopamine receptors. So like, how do you, how do you find that, that balance while also, as you say, in having watched uh, a number of your episodes, you do throw in a lot of stuff for the parents too. Like that is very like <laughs> sly, you know, and, and it's, it's great, but how, how do you find a balance? How do you, I mean, is your writing process extremely like extensive i would imagine just to be able to get all that stuff into a tiny format gosh yeah i mean we kind of approached it none of us are hollywood veterans we're <laughs> all sort of outsiders and uh we just took the learnings we had from these ads where we needed to literally distill tons of information down to three minutes and so we kind of took the same process into the show uh, and so the, the, some of the people that we work with who are more industry animators have told us, man, your writing is way long, but we're like, we just want to make sure it's right. Like we rest on the writing of the show. And so we take like six weeks to write and then we take nine months about to, to make the episode, each episode. And so it is a long process, but um, we, part of the secret sauce for us is um, we're a crowdfunded and crowd supported show. And so we're literally running the episode by parents months before it comes out. And we're running it by our fans and just making sure that this is what they want. Um, not to the point of like the fans dictate everything, but we listen to them and cause that's where the buck stops. And it is interesting. Like it, it's kind of, there, there is wisdom in the crowd when you can, when you can pull people separately in a way that they don't get group think or become a mob, then they can tell you what they want and you can see the patterns and you adjust it and, 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 and change your show to what they want. So um, I think that's been part of the success. And just I think every script starts out way longer than it ends up. And then and then, you know, we chisel away, we simplify and just get it down to the core uh, lesson of each each episode. And maybe you can talk a little bit again because i want to make sure for anybody who's not yet familiar but perhaps is starting to get a little bit interested in like okay what what is this magical uh children's show but that is for children but that adults uh, like myself can also enjoy what are kind of these you know you mentioned you're covering freedom you have some episodes on bitcoin yeah. how do you structure all these episodes you guys have a, you know three seasons out now a lot of episodes a lot of great clips some of which have gone super viral on social media how do you structure these episodes? You mentioned historical figures, but mm -hmm. you know, do you do you have kind of a rubric of like, here's what we want to get through, here are the things we need to get through to impart the right kind of information? Or you know, how planned out ahead is it, I guess, in advance? Or do you just kind of pick from these larger themes, look for the characters that you want to bring in, and then go from there, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're always lesson first. And then, okay. um, you know, what, what, who could be the guide, who could be the historical figure that could teach that lesson. Uh, and yeah, a lot of these lessons will come from parents. Uh, you know, they'll say, oh, I'd love to have a lesson on inflation, or I'd love to have a lesson on civil disobedience or uh, a lesson on central planning or something like that. Uh, and then, yeah, we just kind of, uh, Pair that with a historical figure, kind of try and teach what they taught, you know, distill it down to kids. Um, and then, I mean, we are an independent show. We're not beholden to Hollywood or to, you know, international markets like a lot of the big blockbusters are. Like, we don't have to bow to what China wants. And so it is cool. We get to be a lot more flexible. Like, if we hear something at a conference, uh, we can just you know, go right to that person and be like, Hey, do you want to make this cartoon with us? <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, 
just some tweet that resonates or something on a podcast. So it's, it is cool because we get to be more nimble and we get it react quicker. Um, it was like when we launched our Bitcoin episode, I think we were the first kids show to, to break it down for kids. I don't even know if there's been another one since that's, that's tried to do it. <laughs> but <laughs> So I don't know, you know, we can, we could probably act quicker and choose the wrong lessons, but we could also choose the right lessons, you know, way faster than, than anyone in, in Hollywood can too. So, um, yeah. Any other questions on that? Well, I, I mean, I guess, you know, you, you mentioned just, uh, the fact that you guys are not like Hollywood people, you're also not beholden to those same uh, interest groups or national interests uh, that cause a lot of TV shows or movies to kind of fold under pressure and compromise their message, compromise their content. Can you talk about like working through Angel, uh, the uh, the I guess it's, it's the production company or it's the they're the uh, the hosting platform our studio like in, yeah our, stu our studio, studio. See, yeah i'm very much not a hollywood guy so I, I need some help here so how how does that all work how did you guys get linked up with them and kind of what's their uh you know what's their mo how are they operating how are they different yeah so angel's been a great partner since the beginning we crowdfunded the show uh and they also invested in the show think of it as sort of its own company but there are like exclusive distributors so they can put it on other platforms. Uh, they can put it, you know, they, they, they monetize it on angel and help grow the show. Um, so yeah, they, an angel for those of you who don't know, it's a free app angel studios. You can just download the angel app. Angel.com was actually owned by Michael Saylor at some point, which is no all way. sorts of coincidences. <laughs> I think he sold it for something like a hundred million and Angel bought it for two. So like it it's a it was a funny time. He sold it at the peak, they bought it at the trough. But um wow. uh yeah, really, really fun. Um and and Angel sort of their mission is to tell stories that amplify light and tell stories that spread good. And um and Tuttle Twins fits their criteria exactly. Um we found a great audience there. Uh, with the Angel audience, and uh, the founders of Angel are just big time Bitcoiners too, and so they're kind of seeing it as, man, we get to uh, spread amazing messages, and um, yeah, actually, some of the founders uh, helped the Ron Paul campaign back in the day, and so sort of that OG um, libertarian wave, and so it's been it's been really fun to um, yeah work with Angel. And uh, I'll speak a little bit to the the style, the, the kind of what makes Angel different. Um, so it, it goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, where like the crowd chooses what gets made at Angel. So they have something called the Angel Guild, where if you subscribe to Angel, it's not just a, like a subscription, but you're actually part of this like gatekeeper group, where instead of like five studio execs greenlighting a project, it's literally hundreds of thousands of people of the people of the audience who will actually like support the show. And so if it doesn't pass the approval approval of that crowd, it doesn't get made. And so that's sort of the difference with angel. And um, in the end, their popcorn meter on rotten tomatoes, like the audience score is higher than any other studio. It's like 95% on average. So they can call hits way before uh, you know, they sunk millions into distribution or into the the production. So it's it's pretty pretty cool um, to get that early barometer on success. Um, and then yeah, it just uh, um, it just allows the fans to kind of evangelize it and get their full support behind it and uh, kind of own the the shows that they that they help support. Whether you have kids already or you're planning to have kids. I know that you want to save Bitcoin for their future, but if you want to do that, you need to make sure you keep your Bitcoin safe. So go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker for 5% off the fully open source Bitcoin only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. Then get your Bitcoin off the exchange and into your own custody so that the exchange can't rug you and your future generations. The Bitbox team has been great to work with. They build easy to use open source solutions to keep your Bitcoin secure. And not only is the Bitcoin in your Bitbox safe from government confiscation, 
but Bitbox is one of the only two wallets to actually address the dark Skippy vulnerability, so you are in luck if you have one. And I cannot emphasize this enough, but the Bitbox O2 is extremely easy to use, whether you're brand new to Bitcoin and it's your first time setting up a hardware wallet, or you're a well-seasoned psychopath. It is Bitcoin only, and it is fully open source. You can head to their GitHub and verify that for yourself. No need to trust me or Bitbox. When you go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use the promo code walker, not only do you get 5% off the Bitbox O2 or anything else in their store, but you also help support this podcast. So thank you. Okay, that is, first of all, kind of fascinating. I actually was not aware of the approval process uh, within that, that Angels Guild. But so, I mean, it's really kind of fascinating, of course, drawing parallels to, you know, Bitcoin versus fiat here. The, the, the fiat studio is very top down, right? Like you said, a, a board of executives who decide this is what's good and this is what's bad. And, and we see oftentimes, like you look at Disney, a lot of their recent programming has done really, really poorly because you get some like woke execs in there who decide on oh, this is what we need to do. And like, you know, screw the fans. What, what they say doesn't matter. We're going to tell them what they should like versus this very bottom up. I mean, really decentralized approach to decision making to gatekeeping that says, this is what we as individuals acting freely of our own accord say we want. And it turns out the crowd, I mean, just judging by the metrics you, you said, the crowd is smarter than just this small group of isolated individuals who are probably pretty out of touch with what the average viewer genuinely wants. And, and like, clearly, like, again, Disney is a great example of that, that failure of that centralized top-down approach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when you when the little pool you're swimming in, when you have like four trans children, and, and your net worth is way higher, and you did you ignore middle America? I mean, you're going to be so out of touch. It's central planning at its finest um, in the entertainment industry. But yeah, absolutely. Do you think? I mean, kind of more broadly, what do you think? Just personally, are some of the things that you think the entertainment industry is really getting wrong today, but more specifically getting wrong for kids programming? Like where are they, where are they failing? And then how does uh, Angel Studios and then all, specifically Tuttle Twins kind of fill that gap? Like what are these, the big needs that you guys see where, where kids are really being kind of left high and dry? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of garbage out there. Like you were saying, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of studio execs that that are just picking the wrong things. They're gatekeeping wrong. I think there's also a lot of kind of studio execs that um, they they just follow the sort of the addictive dopamine numbers, right? Like you look at Coco Melon, it is off the charts popular, but it's actually like studies have shown it's like crack for kids, right? Like <laughs> it is nothing of substance, right? So it may be. It, it may not be, I don't know, like super terrible um, in terms of what they're teaching. It could be, I, I don't know, my kids watch it, but it's just, a, it's just garbage. Right. And then um, I think, yeah, they're, they're not, they're so, they're not listening to fans. Um, that, that being said, like, I do think there are, there are clear successes. Like Bluey is a huge success. And um, I think the way that they create it is outside of the Hollywood system too. And it's even though Disney licenses it, Disney has no part in, in micromanaging it or making it. And so they've kind of stumbled into that. Um, so I would say there, there are good options out there. Um, it's just of all the options out there, parents just need to be more picky, I think. And, and, and they need to kind of listen to their, to their friends, their peers uh, to, to be able to vet all the, the content that's out there. And, you know, I mean, like ideally kids are spending as much time as possible outside and, and playing and, and, you know, very uh, little time watching TV. But there is also obviously a lot of beneficial content out there now. Like there's a lot of incredible uh, resources, even just like on YouTube, as far as education goes. But how do you guys try to toe the line between, okay, this needs to be interesting enough where kids will actually be like, mom and dad, I want to watch Tuttle Twins. You know, maybe if they get a, 
Uh, I don't I don't know if parents are still giving their kids like you have, you know, 30 minutes a day to watch TV. That was kind of how it was when I was younger. Uh, maybe now it's more of a free for all. But h- how do you make sure that Tuttle Twins is a show that kids will ask that they say, you know, I, I want to watch this versus all of the other stuff that's out there, much of which is very potentially damaging, uh, either in terms of a just like dopamine crack uh, experience mm-hmm. or just a really weird underhanded messaging experience and then but still have it be incredibly educational like that like that must be a fine line to walk because you got to get them in the door first right like you've got to make them want to watch the show yeah that's right it i'd say it's a struggle each episode we just try (laughs) and balance it you know and um i mean yeah like i make the show and my kids have very limited screen time each week and so <laughs> but they know every the first tuesday of every month is tuttle tuesday so they get to watch a new episode you know so um i don't know i mean yeah it really is such a balance we're we're trying to make it good enough but not addictive and you know nutritious enough that hey if they watch this episode you know they can learn about the overpopulation myth or something like that right they can come across with something that will help them live their life a little bit better do you have uh, or or do your kids have a, a favorite episode that like you're like this is the one if I had to pick one or or maybe your kids if they have one that they they like to come back to? Yeah. Oh, let's see. It kind of depends on the week. Um, my son loves spooky, scary subsidies. Uh, they kind of. Yeah. I think it's a it's a, a Mises episode. Yeah, and then learn about subsidies and kind of messed up markets and stuff, uh, and then end up going to a Halloween world um, where uh, the pumpkins uh, have been replaced by onions because onions got a subsidy, and so <laughs> everyone's drinking onion spice lattes and uh, you know carving onions, and it's terrible, and nobody really likes it except the ogres, and um, and so it's kind of a fun. I know we try to like package each of these lessons into like a fun world and kids love the world and they're like, oh, I guess I did learn something <laughs> down the line. So, that, um, yeah, I, I I love that it's got this uh, like G, G-rated Rick and Morty kind of metaverse <laughs> appeal to it. You know what I mean? Uh, where where it's like there's there's always some new adventure where you guys have an opportunity to get really, really creative uh, like with, uh, you were kind enough to give me an advance screening the Bitcoin episode. I won't. I'm not going to drop any spoilers in here because uh, I'll be releasing this before the episode comes out. But you guys got really creative. I texted you about a couple of the things that just had Carl and I sure. dying. Uh, but like, I, I think that was it. Always the decision to have this kind of uh, you know like metaverse time traveling granny that was going to just as from like a creative standpoint. Wow, this gives us a lot of ways to get get really wacky uh yeah i mean we we just tested i think three different concepts by our audience at the beginning and um yeah you you mentioned rick and morty we're big fans of rick and morty (laughs) some of us on the team uh and we just chose sort of we kind of put it before the audience they chose this concept and it does give us so much opportunity to go wherever we want historically or you know, crazy worlds or however it is. So yeah, it's been, it's been very nice for, what, for us as creators. What were the other two, if I can ask, what were the other two options that, that didn't make the cut? <laughs> One of them was a, a dead grandpa. The ghost comes and visits, okay, visits okay. kids. Um, yeah, definitely a, a little bit, um, a little bit more shady. Uh, and, um, I think one was I'm forgetting the other one, but I think there was one where there was this sort of like Jumanji type book kind of thing uh, that the kids entered. Um, and I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting the other ideas. Yeah. I'm sure they were I'm sure they were crazy. And, but yeah. and you said, even at that early stage, you said you, you put it to the audience. So this was the crowdfunding audience basically that had said, we're going to support this. So those are kind of the people that you gave the, uh, the, ability to sort of help craft the direction of it. Is that how it worked? Yeah, that's right. And I think we even may have like hit up our email list of our ad agency too. We're like, oh, we're thinking about making a show. Which do you like? And 
Hey, I'm trying to remember how big it was. I think it's it's pretty small at that point, but it was enough like statistical significance that we knew, okay, there might be some legs to this. All right, let's let's try it. And and you mentioned earlier that uh you guys take a lot of feedback from the fans, from I think, yeah. you know, parents and and kids. Yeah. Is that baked into every episode? Is that kind of uh, you know, so you were talking about the writing process that it's a, you know, six weeks or whatever to write. And then uh, nine months, I think, to actually go through these various stages and obviously the yeah. animation and everything else, uh, all the recording. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? And just, I mean, does that add in any sort of difficulty to the process to always be workshopping it with fans? Or do you think that without that, you wouldn't have the success that you do? I mean, I think we definitely offend more people. Um, <laughs> if we, <laughs> if we uh, you know, half of half of comedy is knowing where the line is and then dialing it back a little bit. And um, so you always have to cross the line. And uh, yeah, the audience is sometimes just that canary in the coal mine. Oh, this is totally off base. Like, why would you do freedom or religion episode like that? Or, you know, <laughs> or it could be sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, we want to make this joke. We think it's really funny. And we can have some people say they don't like it and that's fine. But sometimes we don't even know we've made an offensive joke. And then at least we go in with eyes wide open. We're like, okay, we can put our <laughs> put our flag in the sand and stand by this joke or or it's not worth it to us. Let's let's beat it. And you know, there's a graveyard of jokes in every episode that we have to cut for whatever reason. So yeah, I'd say um it definitely saves us a lot of heartache and um and I mean, in the end, if it doesn't pass an audience score from the Angel Guild, we can't release an episode. So it has to be, you know, have the stamp of the approval of, of the fans. And so it's better to do it early than later. Like if studios actually did that and they ran like the Acolyte or whatever uh, Disney show by fans, you know, months before they came out, like think of how much money they could save from from terrible, terrible flops, right? <laughs> That's actually such an interesting point because I think on its face you think, oh my gosh, this seems like so much extra work to always be running this by the fans, to be so accountable to the fans. But then, you know, you see the dividends paid, so to speak, after you release it and your fans, the people who are supporting the show consistently, telling their friends about the show through yeah. word of mouth, uh, maybe monetarily donating uh, some of their, <laughs> their money to this, you want to keep them happy. And they're the ones who I would assume also they want the show, like they like the show because it is what you have created. They're not going to yeah. steer the show in a bad direction maliciously. That's not, they want to keep watching a good show. So it, it's kind of a, an interesting thing to think about just, yeah, Disney could have saved a lot of money because uh, they have, they have seriously, they have pissed off a lot of fans. That's for sure. <laughs> like uh, again and again and again. Uh, yeah. It almost seems like they're trying to do it at this point. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, another thing I wanted to get into a little bit with you is what I like about the show so much is that, okay, you've got actually quite, quite dense, but approachable educational material. Like you're, you're literally teaching kids about Austrian economics, which so many adults uh, clearly can't seem to grasp or don't want to grasp. Uh, but you're, I think at a larger level, our educational system in general right now seems to be pretty messed up. Uh, I'm someone who, I was homeschooled until high school, uh, so I got a taste of both uh, and really realized how messed up it was from a firsthand experience of having both. And now I just, from the outside looking in, it appears that it's gotten so much worse and there has become far less of a focus, if perhaps there ever was one, on teaching kids how to think. And it's all about teaching them what to think, what you're supposed to think. What makes you a good little worker be? And I mean, I'm just curious because you've got, you've got kids as well. Uh, I don't know if you guys homeschool or do public school, um, but I, I'm just curious, you know, do you think that we're at this point where there is so much of a concentration of power in state schools and in these state indoctrination machines that like a lot of kids are just out of luck? Because maybe either they're, you know, they've been in school for however long. Of course, you know, I know a lot of people who came out just fine from the public schooling system. 
my lovely wife for one. Uh, but I think that's the type of person who bucks back against the system versus being indoctrinated by it. And I'm just curious kind of what your thoughts are, because you guys are educating kids. Like th this is yeah. an alternative form of education and real education. Like if you watch every Tuttle Twins episode, you will have a pretty good grasp of Austrian economics, of sound money, of, of freedom. I mean, you guys talk about the constitution. Like this seems to be more than kids are getting in school these days. W where do you think we're at as a society? And I mean, is, is there hope? Yeah, I think there's absolutely hope. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I'm a product of public school. Um, and I definitely didn't question the money. I didn't question history. I didn't question even what I was learning or, or, or why I was taught to think instead of or why I was taught to like memorize facts instead of, you know, learn how to think. Uh, but I do think that there's been a mass kind of awakening I think COVID accelerated it so much. We've seen that, you know, thousands and thousands of our fans where they learned, oh man, maybe I can homeschool or maybe if I'm not homeschooling, maybe I can supplement my, supplement my kids learning um, with other things, right? And I think, I think there really is this mass distrust of institutions everywhere. And out of that is coming a lot more personal responsibility and personal ownership. And I think the confidence, we're just seeing it over and over and over again. Parents are more confident uh, and and uh, like we're teaching them, they're teaching their kids, the kids are learning. And so I, I, I see so much momentum on that front. I, I think, you know, the emperor has no clothes and so many people just got flashed, you know, and they're just... <laughs> Their their eyes wide open <laughs> and seeing the, seeing the light. Yeah, uh, and hopefully the emperor stays away from the playgrounds uh, while he's That's doing right. the flashing. <laughs> hopefully, but, but you know, I, I I have a lot of hope as well. Uh, and what what uh, I think a lot of people are realizing as they start to wake up is control of education is one of the first things totalitarians must do. They have to control speech and then they have to control education because if you control speech, okay, then you can make anything that's uh, against the party illegal. If you can control education, then you get away from needing to, uh, to convince people by force or by whatever else that this new system is good. You can just teach them that it's good from the moment they leave their parents as early as possible, preferably. And then those parents, and this from talking to countless people who grew up in communism or escaped communism, that that's what they would do. Like you would have the kids that are basically tattling on the parents for, you know, various thought crimes. I mean, it's like the, it's the 1984 is uh, was shockingly prescient. I mean, he Orwell really got a lot of that absolutely correct. And this, this is not theory, this happened in the real world. And so I think taking back the, taking back more of the power and giving it to parents when it comes to being able to educate their kids and not to have them be, even if they are in public school, because again, you, yeah. you know, you're, you're a pretty great guy and you came out of public school as well. My wife, most people, almost everybody that, that I know, I'm a, I'm a weird anomaly, uh, but even I, after being homeschooled, was still susceptible to those same tricks. But if you have things outside of that classroom, at home, in the community, in clubs, in, at church, whatever it may be, that are helping you to think for yourself, in a, and again, this is back to a decentralized approach to that education versus a top-down centralized. And so I, I think I, I view things like independent media and Tuttle Twins and, and some of the other programming on Angel this is a really great way for parents to take the power back. Even if they are, their kids are in public schools. This is something that for even just a few minutes a week can provide kind of a countervailing force to that indoctrination. And, and that's what you need, right? Because like kids, kids are, kids are smart and their brains are sponges. They just need to also be soaking up a lot of good stuff too. And they're going to figure stuff out for themselves. They're, you know, they're, they're not, they're not dumb. They just haven't right. had a lot of experience yet, you know, and, yeah. and, and clearly they're not dumb because you've got kids that love the Tuttle Twins, which I think a lot of Fiat economists won't, you know, they, they would get confused at the episode. So you're doing <laughs> something right there. Well, 
Walker, it's so interesting. Like, you know, my son, I was talking to him the other day and he was talking about how he doesn't want his piggy bank to be stolen by the inflation monster. And so he's storing his money in gold and Bitcoin. And like he told me, dad, people must know. They must know about Bitcoin. And so, it, but, but it, it's amazing. Like I have a conversation with him and then I have a conversation with like my uncle or, you know, grandpa, people who just, their minds have been solid, like ossified, right? It, it, it's so much harder for them to catch up. They have to unlearn so much. And it really is like, if you want to change the world, you start with the kids. And uh, the difference with us is like, we're not, we're not hiding anything in the show like what's in the show is on the package, right? And that's kind of the difference between some of the other stuff, the other kids shows is they'll they'll kind of hide it from parents and sneak it in. And we're like, you get what you get. <laughs> if you love it, like show this to your kids. If not, don't worry about it. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was, um, like you were talking about this, sort of these parents reclaiming their power. Um, we didn't know this till recently, but like in Germany... Uh, it's been illegal to homeschool your kids since the Nazis. Yeah, I think it was shortly before the Nazis. And so that's that's wild that like other countries like Sweden, Germany, a few other European nations, you cannot homeschool. Like the state, the state has a monopoly on the education of your kids. And so uh, like parents, you have so much more power than you think. Uh, and, and you really, even if your kids are in public school, that's not the only well of knowledge that they have to drink from. Like you can expose them to so much. And I mean, in the end, we want to teach the kids to think for themselves too. We have an episode all about critical thinking. Uh, and uh, it's like, uh, it's called cracking conspiracies. And <laughs> the tagline is, um, oh, what is it? We always distill it down to like a tagline for each episode. Uh, question all you hear, critical thinking makes it clear. So we were even like question, even question this show, like look it up like, <laughs> as we're teaching kids about Operation Northwoods. But like, you know, we, we want kids to question everything and to learn how to think. And I think that's the goal. And and I think more and more parents are just waking up uh, to that knowledge. <laughs> that, first of all, that's uh, awesome title and tagline there. But no, it, it's, it is crazy. I, I had only recently, like in the past couple of years, found out about the in Germany that it's illegal. And I, and I think you're right. It is from pre uh, or fr from like the Nazis instilled the rule. I'm pretty sure, uh, which is just insane that you would leave something like that in place <laughs> when it's very obvious the kind of people who put that rule in place and why they put it in place. Like that's insane. But nobody afterwards was like, Hmm, well, we're really trying to make up for this, you know, uh, whole Nazi thing now as as Germans, maybe we should get rid of that insane rule that says uh, children have to be indoctrinated, educated, excuse me, by the state. Like, that's nuts. Like, uh, we're, America has its flaws, but at least it's not illegal to homeschool your kids. You know, yeah. that's, that's, that is just nuts to me. Oh, I, I could go off on Germany for a while. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to talk a little bit about, okay, so, you know, you mentioned that the show is, it's not a, it's not a Bitcoin show. Bitcoin is part of some of these, these tools, these lessons that you're teaching kids um, and teaching parents who should know them too. But you have, uh, you've now, you're about to release the second Bitcoin episode kind of into the Bitcoin verse. Can you talk about that a little bit without, you know, without giving any spoilers, but just how you approach these Bitcoin episodes and, and fitting them into the rest of your programming and, and what the response kind of was to the first uh, time you did this? Like, was there any unexpected pushback maybe from some parents who were not, uh, not orange pilled yet, but maybe they did become so later or uh, how has been the experience integrating Bitcoin content into the larger show? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. When we were first considering doing a Bitcoin show, an episode, um, Jeffrey Harmon, one of the founders of Angel, was really bullish on it. He was like, just do it, put it out there. This is the future. You want to be able to say that you, you know, took a stand before everyone else did, right? And um, 
there was a definite risk at the start. Like we had known that our audience would come along for the ride, that the money's broken, like our inflation monster episode had done incredibly well before then. Uh, we just weren't entirely sure if they'd come along for Bitcoin. And so we thought, well, at least the audience will agree with half of this episode, <laughs> right? So yeah, we put it out. Um, and like I was saying before, just the Bitcoin community came out in droves. Our audience loved it. There were some like a, a minority of people that were like, what? Like you're doing a crypto episode. Like does it, what about Sam Bankman Freed and all this other stuff? But like the majority of them loved it and it ended up getting over 40 million views across the app and social media. And so it was like a clear market signal to us that, wow, uh, the world wants this and our audience wants it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was probably, I mean, the best marketing department is the Federal Reserve because I think they just, <laughs> they just primed everyone for that episode. Um but uh, yeah, so so that that was so encouraging. And so after that, like it just kept building and building. We went to Pacific Bitcoin with Swan last year um, and just started talking to more people. Um, I talked to, you know, uh, BTC Sessions there and learned about his part in the Canadian trucker protest and just all the ideas from that conference sort of solidified in our heads. Um, and we thought, well, uh, like when we wrote the first episode, we based it off of a small part of the Bitcoin standard. And that like was a world changing book for us as writers. And we thought, man, we really need to hit like the rest of this book. And so I think that's been the vision. Like, let's do this episode that's going to come out um, all about, you know, Bitcoin versus controlled money or CBDCs. And uh, and then just to see the downstream effects of what happens when somebody controls the money versus an uncontrolled or decentralized money like Bitcoin. And then I think if 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 this episode does well and the audience loves it, um, we're going to charge forward. And honestly, I would love to do a time preference of money episode and kind of kind of finish it off with a good trilogy and, and, and distill the Bitcoin standard that that not, you know, everyone's going to read into three cartoon episodes that I think a lot more people can are going to read. So, um, yeah, but it's very much listen to the audience and if they want more, we're going to make more. That's, that's, that's awesome. And you know, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, slight digression here, but what was your personal Bitcoin journey? Like when did you come around to Bitcoin uh, was this part of a, a larger journey kind of down the Austrian economics rabbit hole or uh, how did, how did you get to be a, a Bitcoiner? Yeah. I mean, for me, so I graduated, joined Harmer Brothers, this ad agency, uh, and, um, had never invested in anything. Uh, and I just asked my coworker, yeah, what do I invest in? And he's like, uh, I just put some money into Bitcoin and Ethereum and so it was very much like, I had no idea what they were, but like before I even started investing in the S&P 500, it was like 2016. I just started putting, you know, $50 here, $50 there. I had no idea what it was. Uh, and then I think like most people, you know, went through the ups and downs of the, uh, of the cycles, uh, lost some money on, on crap coins and, uh, and then, yeah, just, uh, read the Bitcoin standard and that's what really solidified it for me. And yeah, I just got out of everything but Bitcoin and kind of, yeah, I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. So yeah, but it, it, it definitely has been, you know, I think like everyone a process and just knowing what it is by learning what other things aren't. Well said. And I think it's whoever that coworker was that was like, Hey, you should check this out. That's, it's a good coworker. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> ironically dude he got in at the ethereum like uh pre-sale and uh... he just travels the world so i'm not even sure if he's a bitcoin maxi now but uh he didn't need to be because he, he just he did so well with with the early ethereum stuff so but uh yeah he he just travels for his life now so um <clears throat> but I, I love what i'm doing <laughs> yeah well you know 
uh, it's nice to be part of a pre-mine, I guess. Uh, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a very centrally controlled pre-mine. And, and, you know, speaking of centrally controlled, so you did mention that uh, in this upcoming episode, again, I don't want to give uh, any spoilers, but you are talking about Bitcoin versus, you know, decentralized money versus centralized money. And obviously yeah. the ultimate embodiment of that is a central bank digital currency. Uh, did you, as you were going into this episode, you know, you were going to make another Bitcoin episode. Did you know for sure you wanted to talk about CBDCs? Because I think this is something that even a lot of, uh, clearly a lot of adults are not even paying attention to. But like, it, it can be a fairly heavy topic. Uh, and it's a very important topic, though. So did you know that you wanted to like, OK, we we need to talk about CBDCs here like this is this is information that needs to get out there now. Or was there a little back and forth about, OK, maybe there's you know, we can compare it just to regular fiat. You know, there, mm -hmm. how did that happen? Yeah, just listening. We just were listening to the conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in doing the research on the episode, we always do hours and hours and hours of research like just learning more and more about CBDCs uh, ourselves was just very frightening. Um, just the idea of expiring money, like your money could expire, use it or lose it sort of stuff. It's like, it's like it's happening. And what was mind boggling to us in the research process was that the majority of the nations in the world are considering CBDCs. You know, they're either piloting them or they're, they're researching them. You know, we say we're not, and and I don't know. There could be a separate conversation of, well, isn't Tether a C? Couldn't it just be co-opted like a CBDC? And maybe it can be, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, just resisting this as much as possible and getting it in front of freedom-minded people and parents uh, was a big goal for us. Like, uh, I think there was also just, I mean, Trump's mentioned it a couple of times on the campaign trail and just gotten uh, like a roar from the audience, like the. I'll make sure we never make a CBDC. And so I think people are waking up to it. It's not quite as, um, you know, uh, out of sight, out of mind as I think the central banks would like us to believe. Um, and even to the point where now some central banks are just saying, no, it's the digital euro. It's not a CBDC, right? <laughs> like, let's rebrand. Like, I think we've done such yeah. a good job at calling it what it is um, that, uh, yeah, I, I just think it was just feeling like the right time for us. Like, let's, let's, let's put a flag in the sand and call it what it is. And then um, at least somebody can share this around. And I think of the episode, it's always tough to say what's going to go viral of the clips, but I think, I think the CBDC section should have some legs on it and we should be able to get it to millions of people and just, just kind of break it down in a way that they can see, yeah, maybe this isn't, this isn't the best. I, I, I hope it does. And I will personally, uh, share the heck out of it. Uh, you know, I think that first, I just, I, I love what you guys are doing because I think that it's filling like a very big void that's out there. And I hope there are more people who look at what you all are doing with Tuttle Twins and say, oh, you know what? Like I care about kids. I have kids myself, uh, or maybe I want to have kids and I want there to be something out there that's for them. We need more of this type of programming. Have you, have you guys thought about you know, uh, branching into, you know, I'm sure you're very busy with just the one, but have you, you know, thought about, or, or have people approached you about like, okay, we need, you know, a, a whole expansion of this. Like, let's, let's kind of explode this type of content out there, take different approaches to it, tailor to different age ranges, but is, I mean, or is the focus right now just like, okay, let's get the next episode out, nose to the grindstone, <laughs> let's make it happen. Cause I'm sure you're quite busy with just yeah. that. I mean, Walker, honestly, I wish I would have like a 20 year vision of an empire to build, but yeah, very <laughs> much, <laughs> very much just focused on, I mean, I could say the next season, like, what are we going to make for the next season? What are we going to, um, do? Um, so I, yeah, what I would say is like, there's so much room in the space, like there's so much hunger for this type of content. And so if there's anyone listening that has an idea for a show or, or, or some other way, like to reach kids, families, um, more power to you. Reach out to Angel. They're they're like minded people. They're Bitcoiners, and um, uh, yeah, I think I think yeah, the the ocean is wide, and we need a ton more of this content. What I think is kind of incredible is it seems to me that 
this has the potential to be a sly roundabout way of actually getting more parents on board with some of these concepts. Like if their if their kids discover the show, their friends talk to them about it, they start watching it. it it's almost becomes a Trojan horse for educating the parents because like, you want to know what your kids are watching uh, are you, or you should at least, you know, you should care about that. Uh, but I'm wondering if you guys have had anybody reach out that's, you know, maybe they didn't know about the show first, their kids started watching, their kids asked to watch it and then has been a bit of a, a like a personal journey for them or, or is it a lot of parents saying, okay, I know that this is quality educational content that I can deliver to my kids. Is it usually kind of that way as a push or is there some of a, a, a pull that ends up happening there too? Yeah, that's a great question. We've, we've had the occasional pull of kids introducing it to their parents, but I'd, I'd say that's not our preferred way, you know, to get this. Fair enough. <laughs> it's like, that's, that that's like general Hollywood, you know, <laughs> mom, dad, uh, you know, I learned about the expert. What? Like yeah. that, that's kind of shocking for parents if, <laughs> if they're not aligned. <laughs> so. I would say, um, I'm sure we have, and we've definitely had moments where parents are like, you know, I just had it on in the background and suddenly I'm like laughing along and suddenly I'm like questioning, uh, you know, the education system or questioning whatever it is like, uh, subsidies or, um, so like, I would say like, yeah, half our job is to empower parents with education. And we see that time and time again, we've had people be like, um, this husband was like, you know, I've been trying to tell my wife about Bitcoin for years and you guys did it in 20 minutes. Like <laughs> there's a way to orange pill adults with this. There's a way to, to make people, you know, they think they understand what freedom of religion or freedom of speech is, but, um, sometimes they don't know it as deeply as they should. And I don't think a lot of us do. Right. And so uh, getting a refresher with an episode is is great and it's a non-threatening way and it's a way to to feel empowered to teach your kids and then defend what you believe. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's the main goal is it's get it to parents who will get it to kids. Um, but, you know, kids are going to find it, too, sometimes. So, no, very, very true. Kids are kids are inquisitive is what I'm noticing now in mine. Uh, Carlin, my son do doesn't even talk yet, and he's very inquisitive about absolutely everything. Uh, so you know, seal up those those outlets. Um, but you know, one one thing you mentioned there just about kind of this non threatening way to bring in this education. I think first of all, the writing of the show is outstanding. Like it's really clever. Uh, you you sneak in all sorts of little things. Again, you know, jokes that are kind of going to go over the kids' heads, but are are great for the parents. Maybe it's too deep of a historical reference for the kid to get yet, but it's great for the parents. But there there's so much of that that I see in the show. But the big thing that I see is just the humor that's throughout all of it. Uh, and you know, it's you know, you got a, a little bit of, of of slapstick humor in there. Of course, it's it's a cartoon, but it's also a lot of just uh, there's a lot of nuanced humor. That can still apply, you know, and, and kids can find funny, but parents like myself will as well. D do you think that humor is kind of, is it a necessary part of a show like this? It, do we, so much of this world is is very serious and so much of the content out there, uh, not so much for kids, but at least for adults, is just really dry and not very approachable. Do you guys kind of, is humor, like, do you try to lead with that in the episodes? Do you find that that is really an effective way to make sure you get that foot in the door and get that attention and then, yeah, build the message around the humor or how do you approach that? Yeah. I mean, humor is the best. You put down defenses and you just can internalize so much better. It's the, it's the candy coating on the pill. Right. And, uh, and people just internalize it way better. Like you look at the mass media today uh, millions more people get their media from their news from comedians than they do from like the the nightly news, right? Like people want to laugh while they're learning, and um, you know, you look at like even like examples of dictatorships like Pinochet and in, in Chile. Uh, the thing that toppled him was actually like a comedy show that like started to like make fun of him. And like really deliver truth to the people through through comedy. 
And so it really, it like, I think dictators and uh, governments, they, if, the, if they're doing shady things, they hate, they hate comedy because it's the perfect vector uh, for, for just revealing how ridiculous they are. Um, and yeah, I think just people, they don't want to learn. They want to be entertained. And if they, uh, I, 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 let me rephrase it. They, people want to learn. They just don't want to be bored. Right. And so if they are, are, are learning in a fun way, um, that that's not boring, um, they're going to eat it up. So yeah, I'd, I'd say it, it's definitely like a very key part of, of what has made the show work so far. What's the best piece of feedback you've gotten from parents where you guys were like, okay, we're really doing something that matters here. Like what, what was there a moment where maybe even early on where you started getting some feedback that was like, Oh wow. Like we've tapped into something here. We filled, we've filled a void. Yeah, man. Just dozens and dozens and dozens of stories, kids going to Costco and being like, the inflation monster is hurting us, mommy. Look at the prices. They're going up, right? Like it kids at Thanksgiving dinner tables schooling their aunts and uncles on like politics and on on economic policy. Uh we've had uh you know, kids talk about the golden rule in in foreign policy. They just bring it up with their parents like the badge you do blows right back at you. You know, like think of these lessons um if they can be internalized. We've had we've had kids watching the the civil disobedience episode with Harriet Tubman uh, refused to wear masks at school and get in trouble for it and go to the principal's office. We had a kid uh, had a Gadsden flag on his backpack and he stood up for what he believed in. The, the teacher called it racist or something like she had no clue what it was. And he went to the principal's office. He was taken out of school. And this is what he learned from Tuttle Twins. So like the it's just, yeah, dozens of stories of these kids being empowered by knowledge and by truth and then being brave enough to apply it in the real world. So yeah, it's been very humbling. I mean, it's amazing how clearly sticky the messages are when you guys are presenting them in this way. Like, if, I, I mean, I, I love the story about Costco and the inflation monster. I mean, that's, that's just incredible, but like, it's something that they, they remembered, right? They, mm -hmm. it, it really stuck with them. They associated it with, with that and then went out into the real world away from the TV and identified that, oh, look, like this is so bad what the inflation monster is doing to us. I mean, that it, like, I don't know, that's that's beautiful. Like, that's what you want, though, right? Because they're actively looking out in the real world, thinking now for themselves, but applying these lessons. And I like and I, it, it gives me hope that the kids are going to be all right. You know? Uh, yeah, these I mean, yeah, I, I feel like the kids that are watching Tuttle Twins are like years and years ahead of anywhere I was at that age. And um, yeah, it gives me a ton of hope for the future. And I, I absolutely love it. And just speaking of the future a little bit. So can you, can you talk at all? Are there some episodes that you guys have really been like waiting to do or wanting to do that are kind of on your list where you're like, we, we really need to, to do an episode on this. Are, are there any of those that you guys are like really holding out for psych to make in the future, but are, you know, haven't been produced yet? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't think we could ever have done a Bitcoin episode in season one. We needed to gain trust before we kind of led them down the rabbit hole, if you will. Uh, and there are more episodes that, that we have coming for season four, season three, uh, that we're super excited about. And now that we kind of have the trust and of the audience, we can do them. Uh, and now that we're big enough, uh, we have we're talking to kind of household names that people we can't announce yet, but people who will be starring in season four of Tuttle Twins. And it's super exciting. So some of the episodes were that are on the docket, we want to do one on the medical industrial complex, not sponsored by Pfizer. <laughs> uh, we want to do one on, yeah, on um, uh, like the proper role of charity how, um, you know, it's not just giving a man a fish, it's teaching them to fish and also ripping down the walls around the ocean. All right. And uh, um, we're going to do one on the military industrial complex that comes out this season. Uh, and so uh, kind of break that down in a way. Um, it's like a school uh, 
cafeteria fights and stuff in a way, in a way that kids can understand that when these cafeteria fights keep happening, it's like the food suppliers that are doing really well, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, I think I mentioned this one before, but uh, yeah, the overpopulation myth episode uh, is is going to be our season premiere for season four. And just like teaching kids, like, we're grateful you're here. Uh, you provide more abundance for everyone. And for every kid born, there could be an Elon Musk. There could be a Satoshi that makes the world more abundant for everyone. And even despite the rampant government theft through inflation, like the world is getting more abundant. And I think that's harder for someone who's stuck in the rat race to see. Um, but like we're living like kings compared to, uh, you know, kings uh, centuries ago. And so, um, yeah, it really is uh, such a hopeful message. And there's so much anti-humanist garbage out there that, you know, teach kids to feel guilty for being alive. And I'm just excited to get that out there, too. I mean, that's a, it's a beautiful message to put out there. So, I mean, you got medical industrial complex, military industrial complex, overpopulation, Bitcoin, CBDCs, Austrian economics, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, co the constitution more broadly, subsidies uh, explained by, by Mises. I mean, this is quite a curriculum you guys are putting together here like this i mean you're making it boring you're making it boring walker no i know i know okay yeah no it, 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 it's Don't much more curriculum yeah yeah sorry sorry uh, but it, but but that's like that's incredible like this is a resource now that yeah. parents have that kids have to be able to go and like like honestly these things you're because you're breaking them down for kids it's like these explanations are that's what most adults need to hear something broken down as too. You know, like it's, it's not that it needs to be dumbed down for kids. It's that it needs to be simplified for anyone to be able to understand it quickly. And I don't know. I just, I think that that's, that's amazing. And again, for anyone who has not yet checked out Tuttle Twins, please do, uh, because I guarantee you will learn something and you will laugh and uh, if you have kids, you know, you've got now something that's really productive for them to watch and very enriching. And, you know, on another question, I want to be conscious of your time here too, but do you have, like, is there like a, a big takeaway that you want kids to get? Like, is there a, a lesson that you hope they come away from watching Tuttle Twins? Like more broadly, you know, so yeah, you've got, you've got inflation, you've got these different individual lessons but is there a more broad lesson that you hope that kids come away with? Yeah, I, I would say be the change you want to see in the world. Um, knowledge empowers you. Uh, and this knowledge will make you very successful. Uh, be kind to others. Uh, you know, respect their rights. Um, and, and yeah, like you can change the world with the things that you're learning. And also question the show. <laughs> question, question everything think for yourself <laughs> it, that, that it's a very uh don't trust verify ethos mm -hmm. if i if i do say so myself no, yes I, I i love that and is there is there anything we didn't cover here today that you want to get out there um I'll also give you a chance to send people uh to all of your sites and everything i'll link it in the show notes but is there anything that you wanted to get into that we didn't get a chance to yet I, th I think just like we'll be debuting this episode um, for our Bitcoin sequel episode. Um, it's called the Bitcoin Bash and Corrupted Cash. Um, and it will come out next Thursday. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, we'll be releasing it wide on every social media platform. It's actually the only episode in season three that we got permission to go outside of the the angel app. So it's going to be available on every platform. Um, and yeah, give it a watch, uh, see if you agree with it. And if you do share it with your kids. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say, uh, we're always listening. So like join our email list, like give us feedback if you like. Um, and then, uh, you can watch seasons one and two of the show for free. Just go to angel.com slash Tuttle twins or download the angel app. 
And then if you want to help support the show and see the latest season, season three, you can uh, join the Angel Guild where you'll get a vote on every episode. You get a vote on, you know, movies, shows, things like that, and kind of be one of those gatekeepers that controls the future of uh, at least the entertainment world for Angel. So, yeah, that's what I'd say. And yeah, man, always a pleasure to talk to you, Walker. Um, I love this podcast. I've been a long time lurker. So uh, uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. And that, that that means a lot. And uh, I've got another question for you that is totally unrelated. I usually, I like to ask people if they're reading anything right now that they'd recommend, but maybe too, I'd also ask either, are you reading anything you'd recommend or are you and your kids reading anything that you would recommend to parents? Yeah, I'll start with mine. Um, so I'm reading Fiat Food. Um, that's been really eye-opening. And splitting my mind on the other side i'm reading this book called super abundance it's actually right here so it's kind of it's kind of the flip side of of yeah like the world is getting much more abundant uh and so it's kind of it's kind of tearing my mind in two <laughs> how are we how are we getting poorer and yet more abundant too but um yeah so i i would recommend honestly reading reading both books that is phenomenal books um and i'm like yeah with my kids Gosh, we're just reading The Hobbit right now, and that's that's nice. about that's about it. Uh, <laughs> besides, you know, we we make each of the episodes of Tuttle Twins into like little graphic novels, so we'll read those too, and actually probably more than we watch the show. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that, and then I just look out for like hidden messages in other kids' books. Did you have you read Rainbow Fish, man? Like it's been so many years since I read Rainbow Fish. That is like a communist book. <laughs> I, I, I have not since I was a kid, but now I'm going to have to go back. Are they sneaking some commie it's, knowledge? It's all in there? about, you know, you have way more um, sparkly uh, fins than you need. And <laughs> got to share them with everyone. So everyone's special. Anyways, um, yeah. I, it's, I it's need to go back and read this over now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. I, I, I love it. Um, and now I'm going to, ha- I'm going to have to go. I think we might have it for my son in the, our little book box up there. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go check out if they snuck in that, that commie propaganda in there. But, but Johnny, this was, this was really a, a treat. Uh, angel.com for people. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the Tuttle Twins website specifically is, uh, for the TV show is, uh, Kate, what's that one? Just so I can, a- if anyone's angel.com listening. Angel.com slash Tuttle Twins. Okay, or, you know, awesome. you could honestly just Google Tuttle Twin Show yeah. and you'll find us. So Google has yeah. not suppressed your search results yet for not dealing yet. out. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, any, have you guys done a, like a online censorship slash conglomerate, like Google, you know, mega corp conglomerate type episode yet? Is I'm trying oh, to remember. Man, we, do, I know you... we, we have one on digital privacy uh, okay. that just came out last month. Um, with a guest star that may or may not be Edward Snowden, but it's not, but it sounds like him <laughs> and it's anonymous. Uh, we tried to get Edward on the podcast. It's just hard to get a hold of for some reason. Yeah. That's, so, um, I can't imagine the, why. <laughs> or on the show. So, um, yeah, but, but I mean, I think we will, we will go into big tech, I think a little bit later, but I mean, that, that's really just like, okay, look at the government and digital companies siphoning your data and protect yourself online and, um, yeah, stuff like that. And- uh, yeah, there's, you know, the nice thing about this crazy clown world that we live in is that it gives a lot of content ideas to you guys. Uh, so, you know, I guess <laughs> that's uh, that, that's that's a great benefit there. That's but, right. <laughs> well, Jai, man, thanks so much for your time. This was really enjoyable. I'm gonna I'm gonna get this out to folks uh, in the, either uh, possibly tonight, uh, depending on how soon my lovely wife and son go to bed. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. But thank you again. Really appreciate your time. Uh, this was a pleasure. And thanks for everything you guys are doing with the show. I really enjoy it. Uh, I know a lot of other adults really enjoy it and Bitcoiners. And uh, looking forward to when my son is old enough that he can uh, start to understand it a little more. That's awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Walker. And that's a wrap on this Bitcoin Talk episode of The Bitcoin Podcast. If you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring The Bitcoin Podcast, 
head to bitcoinpodcast.net slash sponsor or send an email to hello at bitcoinpodcast.net. If you are enjoying the Bitcoin podcast and find it valuable, give it a boost on Fountain, a five-star review wherever you're listening, or better yet, share this show with your network so more people can learn about Bitcoin. Or don't. Bitcoin doesn't care, but I sure do appreciate it. You can grab links in the show notes to watch or list this show wherever you get your podcasts or go to bitcoinpodcast.net slash podcast. And you'll also find the links to follow me and the show on Noster and on X. Bitcoin is scarce. There will only ever be 21 million. But Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for spending your scarce time to listen to the Bitcoin podcast. Until next time, stay free.